Coming to you live from our houses in Los Angeles, California, it's Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone, your comedy field guide to life. Tonight, biodiversity. When nature's diversity is threatened, does that make us more vulnerable to COVID? Did the extinction of the Sumatran rhino cause men in the United States to wear face paint, fur headdresses, and buffalo horns? Has the wrong species been driven to extinction? Ecologist Lauren E. Oakes is here to talk about biodiversity, the origin of viruses, and possible win-wins when it comes to nature-based solutions to climate change. Plus, mailbag! Tony Nita Hull opens up the listener mailbag and discovers a wonderland of epistolary diversity. I'm Adam Felber, the man who tries to maintain our conversation's ecological balance in a never-ending battle against the extinction of logic. And now, please welcome the woman whose topical diversity sprouts new and ever-weirder conversational life forms each week. It's Paula Poundstone. Hey, guys! Why, thank you so much. Lovely to be with you. Uh, hey, Adam, and thanks to tonight's house band returning champion David Bragger from, hey, Los Angeles! Hey. He's a master of old-time American fiddle and banjo and the founder of Tiki Parlor Recordings. Check out Old Time Tiki Parlor online at www.oldtimetikiparlor.com. And that's Tiki Parlor with an O-U-R at the end. That's a very Oldie good style. Point. Yep. Tiki Parlour. You wouldn't call it Old Time Tiki Parlor and spell it parlor like the new way. Yeah, that's not right. All right. Paula, uh, what's new with you? Well, uh, I'm, I am voraciously taking in uh, Moby Dick. Well, let's get right to it then. Let's hit the book club. Moby Dick, as everybody knows, this is um, week three of our book club, and boy, we've we've been, we're rocketed off to a great start, really dissecting the Herman Melville masterpiece. What do you got? Well. Uh, I have to confess that uh, a listener tweeted me and suggested that I listen uh, on Spotify. And you know what? I did. And uh, I've forgotten to write down the name of the reader, but he's great. And uh, I carry it with me everywhere I go. Um, got a hell of a shock in the shower. Uh, but uh, I am really enjoying <laughs> listening uh i believe it's in chapter four uh where um and i think it's ishmael that says it a good laugh is a mighty good thing and rather too scarce a good thing the more is the pity um i also found a, a quote in the book that says uh one fish two fish red fish blue fish black huh. fish blue fish old fish new fish this one has a little car this one has a little star that is particularly meaningful to me. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red and some are blue. Some are uh, yeah. old and some are new. It's a great, great Melville writing. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm on chapter 101, but on the right. very surface level of chapter 101. Are you really so, at a chapter 101? Yeah, I am. You are yeah. almost done with the book. Yeah, and my dogs love it. Um, <laughs> so, Mo, I, sometimes you know, I, I I need to point out that about a week ago you were you were just giving me holy hell for being as far as chapter twelve, saying that there's no way I could take in a story of that breadth and complexity with that many interest, you know, different uh, words, difficult words. Um, and, and now you're on chapter one hundred and one. Yeah, just goes to show, can't beat them, join them. <laughs> 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 so um what's your feelings about the story besides uh besides that uh ishmael said something about laughing in chapter four well uh, listen as as a person who's written a couple of books and dealt with editors before uh, i would say that either the editor was his dad um or <laughs> someone that <laughs> He, it's someone that was just plain blackmailing him, uh, or, or the other way around, that he was just plain blackmailing. Because honestly, there are, you know, I, I could cover 
several chapters in the book, not not in a row, but several of the chapters could have been taken out entirely just by saying this phrase, the whale is big. Oh, yeah, there's all those whale chapters. I remember them from when I was little. Yeah, there's, yeah, uh, yeah, there were, there's a lot of stuff about whales. I can't your mother tried to read this book to you as a kid. That it was, is... It's, it, when I am reading it now, it it strikes me that it's completely insane that she that she ever thought that that was going to happen. Yeah, I we think your mother was maybe nipping at the hooch a little bit in the evening. Oh, she was constantly nipping at the hooch, but also a oh. gifted writer. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, maybe she said it was going to be Moby Dick, and then she read, "Here are some who like to run. They run for fun in the hot, hot sun. Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my! What a lot of funny things go by. Some have two feet, and some have four. Maybe that's what she was reading, Adam. And you just she convinced you that it was Moby Dick. Some are fast, it's, it's, and some are slow. It, that's possible, I guess. Um, uh, let's let's move on down the line. Uh, <laughs> let's go to Sherman Oaks. Uh, no, Tony Anita no. Hall, how's how's your reading coming? <laughs> I admittedly did not read anything additional this past week. Um, that's because you were really ruminating. Like no, that's because you were reflecting on your last week's reading. That, that's true. That's true. Um, so I wanted to bring something to the table. So I Googled um, Moby Dick facts in the fashion of a. a You're pulling Captain a Burns. Pringle. I'm Burnsing it over oh here. Oh, my God. Um, did you know that only 3,715 copies of Moby Dick were purchased during Melville's lifetime? Mostly by his dad, the editor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, it only he only made five hundred and fifty six dollars off of the dick. Um, well, wow. <laughs> <laughs> he should have used it differently. He he could have made more. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. He, uh, wow. So that, yeah, not a lot of, geez. And imagine, I mean, the time th- that must have gone into writing this book. I, if anybody else is considering writing Moby Dick, I would say don't do it. It's not cost effective. <laughs> well, especially now when that is in the public domain, you'd be writing something that, that, that won't earn you any money at all, really. Yeah. Well, apparently, I mean, I, if you break that down uh, into the hourly wage, um, he didn't, you know, he made pennies on the, if that, per hour. Uh, that is just sad. So, Paula, you blasted through 100 chapters. Uh, Tony, none. Bonnie, uh, <laughs> what's your progress in the book? Uh, up, up in the Simi Valley, Bonnie Burns, how's, uh, how's Moby Dick coming for you? Okay, well... Here's what happened. Paula told me about the <laughs> book on. No, no, Whenever no. Whenever you start I... with a "Here's what yeah. happened," yeah, it, something bad has happened. Yeah, I could go back farther than this, but I've decided to do you guys a favor. So Paula told me about how how far she'd gotten, and I think when she told me, she was only she was on chapter fifty eight, and she said that, uh, you know, she'd gotten this really good version on Spotify. So I went over. I got the version on Spotify. It's read by um, a guy named Hayward Morris, and I wanted to give a shout out to him. Oh, it's not the same guy. It's not the same guy? It's a different guy for me. Anyway, this guy's magnificent, too, although I will say, agreeing with Paula, after a while, it's like, okay, it's magnificent writing, but get on with it. But I have a question to ask (laughs) you guys, which is... Is it true that in an early chapter, I think it's it's when he's at the inn, that he's sleeping with a cannibal who has an axe in his mouth? Or is that a metaphor? I don't think it was in his mouth. I think he had no, it with I, him. Queequeg is not a cannibal. Uh, he calls him a cannibal quite a bit, but but there's no evidence that Queequeg actually eats yeah. people. Um, I think you might... You're, you're thinking about he the tomahawk, people. which is how... Um, Oh, Which Tom is how refers to he yeah that's that's his pipe it's a it's a kind of pipe oh uh, no, I well, thought he slept with a weapon of some sort i I think he does 
Yeah, that's what he says. You know what? I'll tell you something. Quite honestly, it's so many chapters ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, I do have to ask you guys something. Most of the audiobooks that I've come across of Moby Dick, and I don't really do audiobooks, um, but most of them are about 21 hours long. Paula, have you really nope. listened to like 18 hours of audiobook? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You have. Because... I, I I listen while I walk the dogs. I listen. Um, I use headphones and listen while I vacuum. I listen while I dust. I listen while I do the dishes. Um, and <laughs> I, th- how, how about this? I even some nights I turn off Breaking Bad so that I can listen to Moby Dick. That's really something. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. craziness um, on a stick. Although I will say, did you read the part yet where um, Queequeg uh, encounters um, uh, Gus? Uh, Gus from the chicken place. No, I, I, I that <laughs> that feels that feels a little bit like somebody was watching Breaking Bad without sound while listening to Moby Dick and fell asleep. Oh, um, yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. That well, you mean I'll tell you Gus something. from Dos Hermanos. Yes, and by the way, you're wrong about Queequeg not being a cannibal because he ate Gus. Um, oh, okay, <laughs> I, I may have conflated. I'm starting to feel like like book club is turning into a dismal failure. Uh, no, in but, fairness, uh, I may have I might conflated. Bail. I'm not gonna lie, I might bail on Moby Dick. <laughs> no, you can't bail. I'll get wait, out. I have. T- <laughs> I have one more wait, thing what for about Adam. This? Oh, okay, go ahead. Okay, well, a person named Vinny Lovegrove uh, wrote in on Facebook and wanted Adam to know that Ishmael traveled to New Bedford, Mass., not to New Bedford, Connecticut. Yeah, And yes. called you a landlubber barnacle-sucking likes of Adam Felber. <laughs> wow, you, you don't miss those opportunities when they come, do you, Bonnie? Yeah, and you, uh, <laughs> and you felt the need to pass that on? No, well, I did... I did. I did think that the New Bedford that I had mentioned was wrong, so I, I did look it up, and and yeah, it's 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 New Bedford right on Buzzards Bay. <laughs> oh well, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um. Okay. What about this? And I forget what chapter it was in, but what about this? Sin that pays its way can travel freely and without a passport, whereas virtue, if a pauper, is stopped at all frontiers. That was something that. Trump signed into law, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I am finding it very topical, but Paula, all your quotes are from like the first few chapters. Yeah. Well, that's when I had my hands free to write down a quote. <laughs> all right. Uh, Can't write it down a quote in the middle of the night, for God's sakes. I was assuming that we were getting to, uh, you know, just get a few chapters forward in book club. So I was going to raise the question um, of... Is it in some ways? Is this a love story between Queequeg and uh, and Ishmael? I'm not so not at the. There's a lot of there's a lot of literary theory out there now that says that that you know this is one of the first depictions of a gay romance in in uh, literature. Well, although that's a, certainly a possibility, but at the same time, uh, uh, they. He barely mentions him in most of the book. Well, I don't know. I, I'm only I'm only sixteen chapters in. <laughs> well, well, in the early chapters, yes, they have a they have a wonderful friendship, and and one has to assume that that friendship continues. But it's it's really not referred to uh, in most of the book, which is maybe because they couldn't refer to it. I don't know. They they're not exchanging love notes or or anything. Um, it, I, I mean, I could see where someone might get that idea, but I would say it's not the story of that. Okay. <laughs> now you're conflating. Um, I, I, I guess I could be. Um, yeah, well, um, I am just completely amazed at our ability to mess up something as simple as a book club. We can, <laughs> you know what? Okay, you know why we're not really moving forward the way we should? It's because we haven't chosen officers I would like to be the treasurer of the book club. Okay. <laughs> Let's make Ken president. 
Let's make Ken president. He's down Ken? here. Um, <laughs> Can I be the yeah. secretary? Can you be the... Oh, uh, you. Uh, Tony wants to be the secretary of the book club. Uh, yes. Yeah, I think so. Yes. T- uh, take this down. Some are fast, some are slow, some are high, some are low. Not one of them is oh, like I another. Don't have a pen and paper. <laughs> oh, for Christ's sakes! What kind of a secretary are you? Tony. Tony is Della Street. Oh, don't ask us God why. Sakes. Go ask your mother. Hey, um, hey, um, treasurer, do you have a word for us this week? Oh yeah. my heavens, do I ever! It's evanescent. It's an adjective that means quickly fading from sight, memory, or existence. Here, I'll use it in a sentence. My memory is so bad, I live in an entire evanescent world. Um, I'd better put it in the vocabulary song before it slips my mind. Uh, Here we go. Uh, This week's word is evanescent. It's an adjective that means... Um, I had it a minute ago. I can almost see it. Uh, smells like Evan. No, that's not it. Oh, uh, quickly. Oh, quickly fading from sight, <laughs> memory, or existence. Like crews reflecting on the time they tried to kill Pence. Last week's word was rictus. It's a noun that means a fixed grimace or grin. I'm happy for the best actress, even though I didn't win. The week before that, the word was decoction. It's a noun that means the action or process of extracting the essence of something. He's really just a mouth that won't stop lying. Going back before that, we had inscrutable. It's an adjective that means impossible to understand or interpret. Lindsey Graham says stupid shit that I just don't get. Not long ago, we had garrulity. It's a noun that means excessive talkativeness, especially on trivial matters. I have nine cats. I used to have 16. For a while, I had 11. They all left my furniture in tatters. Now I just have an Adirondack chair because it won't collect hair or pee. Let's never forget Gallimaufry, which I pronounced wrong (laughs) until nobody James Harder corrected me. It's a noun that means confused jumble or medley of things. Hodgepodge, who's podge, hodgepodge. Adam doesn't think my song is replicable. Replicable, replicable, but I do, I do, I do. <laughs> yeah. Woo! Encore! So, Paula. I, Encore! I, I oh, have boy. to say, my thinking about your song has changed, because now I do think it's replicable, but I don't think it's a song. Oh, it is. Okay, it's a okay. song. Not okay. long ago, we had garrulity. It's a noun that means excessive talkativeness, especially on trivial matters. I have nothing. Yeah, cats. Sounds, see, that's a song. Sounds more like a chant or a prayer to me, but you know, uh, you know, teach his own. Anyway, coming up, biologist E.O. Wilson wrote Biodiversity is the totality of all inherited variation in the life forms of Earth, of which we are one species. We study and save it to our great benefit. We ignore it and degrade it to our great peril. Let's study biodiversity in all its wonders. That's next on Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. Hey, Paula, you know we have this podcast, right? Yeah, I heard about that. Right, and for fans of our podcast, there's something really fun that you and I are doing. Let's tell them about it. Um, Every Friday, Paula Poundstone and me, Adam Felber, are live on something called the Stereo app. Paula Poundstone and I appear and interact with our fans and have a conversation. All you have to do is download the Stereo app and follow us at Stereo.com slash Adam Felber or Stereo.com slash Paula Poundstone. Uh, we have a, a conversation. Last week's conversation was about uh, commercials that you really can't that even hear one nuts. more time. Exactly. Um, and and uh, listeners joined in and uh, left messages of uh, the commercials that they couldn't stand anymore. It was really fun, actually. It really uh, was. We played listener comments about the commercials they hated. We talked about commercials we hated, and it was a kind of a big party for everyone. One of the effects, of course, of the of the pandemic is isolation, and it's funny because I, after a while, it's you're like a frog in a pot. 
you don't realize. even notice. Yeah. It, right. You don't realize how much you miss people. But it has been fun just uh, getting to talk with you, even using cartoony-looking avatars, um, and just talk yeah. stuff like you would if you were just hanging out. So come talk to us. That's every Friday in the Stereo app. Go download that and then uh, find us at Stereo.com slash Paula Poundstone or Stereo.com slash Adam Felber and join us when we go live. On this day in unremarkable history, Michael Phelps said, I'm all pruney. <laughs> and thank you, House Band David Bragger. Paula, you heard an NPR report on how biodiversity intersects with the COVID pandemic, and it fascinated you. Don't deny it. It did. Yeah, it... Uh... We, we're encroaching. That's one thing. We're encroaching. And then we come closer to animals. And then uh, y- y- we need an expert here. I, okay. I'm not explaining it good. Well, not, 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 not so great, really. But we are fortunate to have an ecologist on the phone line <laughs> who has observed how human beings are rapidly transforming our planet and how the loss of biodiversity affects us all. Lauren E. Oaks is a conservation scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society, an adjunct professor at Stanford University in the Department of Earth System Science, my old job, and author of In Search of the Canary Tree. Please welcome Dr. Lauren E. Oaks. Woo! Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you. Thank you so much for being with us. Let's just start off. uh, What does biodiversity mean? All right. So biodiversity is the variety and variability of life on Earth. Um, I think of it as uh, what's out there across ecosystems, across life forms, across species. Um, But we can also get down to genetic diversity. Um, you can think of endemic taxa. So those are, um, species found only in certain areas, not in others. Um, and then also there's agro or ethnobiodiversity. If you think of all the, um, food that we eat comes from plants, um, that, that type of diversity is also really important. So there's a lot of range of different kinds of biodiversity and different ways to measure it. Um, but good to think about it as all the life on earth and how diverse it is. In, in a book club? Um, biodiversity be, would be some people who are willing to read Moby Dick and some people who aren't. Um, what, <laughs> what, what happens, Lauren, when biodiversity is compromised? What happens when it's compromised? Oh, boy. Um, so much. How's that for a simple answer? That's a good start? answer right there. Um, That's a great answer. <laughs> I think what's hard, I mean, just the term in general, I, I feel like actually the term ecosystem services has kind of caught a little more attention. The idea that humans and nature are really intertwined and we rely upon natural resources in so many ways, whether it's food or water, or the air we breathe. Wait, what did you say? Ecosystem s- services? Ecosystem services. And it's the when, idea. When you call that number, who answers? <laughs> yeah, it does sound. That does sound like sort of a, a department in a larger business known as the planet. Yeah, ecosystem <laughs> services. May I help you? Yeah, I'm looking um, for a new GNU. Uh, it, it, it exists mostly in Africa, but I'm looking for an Asian one. Do you have that? Um. So Ho- hopefully, a lot of policymakers and investors are answering that call. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. All right, now. So what is ecosystem services when, when you say that? What do you mean? Is that the same thing as, every, as so I would, everything? I would put biodiversity under ecosystem services. But ecosystem services are very directly what we derive from nature that sustains us. So you can think about that as like nutrient cycling in, in soils that enable us to farm and produce food. Uh-huh. Um, you can think about it in terms of regulating services. So um, the climate system that enables us to, you know, have a, 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 a climate system to live in and survive. Have in. oxygen. Um, there's lots of, have oxygen, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's lots of different kinds of services. Um, some of them are more tangible than others. Even you can put cultural services, cultural ecosystem services in there. Um, the idea that, um, in reality, that many of us are tied to some sort of sense of place or long tradition in place that are, that's tied to the environment as well. 
Um, but biodiversity is in that under that umbrella, and when it's when it's compromised, it's really linked to everything. I like to think of it as, um, you know, I think it was Aldo Leopold, who was a ecologist, um, American ecologist, said to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. The idea that um, every piece has a function and a part. Um, but I generally say that the more biodiverse we are, the more resilient we are to change. So when we talk about being so, compromised, we mean species becoming extinct we, uh, or, yeah, or leaving an area to, at the very least. For sure. So the world now, I mean, we're facing the loss of prob- estimates of a million species in the years to come. Um, some estimates show around 40% of insects. And some people say, okay, well, well, maybe we could leave them, lose those insects or lose those mosquitoes, but um, they play a, a critical role too in things like pollination or um, helping with, with cleaning. Um, insects play a role in, in even improving water quality in streams. Um, so there's all kinds of ways that life out there contributes to this massive system that we are really just one species. Um, we're just one species in the, in the big matrix here. So it's not just us and bees. We need more. No. <laughs> Wait, back up to mosquitoes. Wait a minute. What do they do? <laughs> well, I, you can, I don't think you could say that a mosquito is, say, like a keystone species, where if mosquitoes um, decline, are we going to lose? Is that going to co- lead to like a whole collapse? Um, I don't know that many people would would, would argue that. So bad example. Um, but, well, <laughs> mosquitoes are part of the food chain We're, that are supporting oh. many other animals or in, um, reptiles that eat them or fish and streams. And you start to affect the um, one population, a mosquito population. And sure, um, you may have some benefit effects that, that people like, <laughs> but you start to, th- those are the effects of that one loss start to trickle up the system. Um, and that's what's called a cascade effect in ecology. And you're going to lose jobs because the um, the the people who make off, yeah, um, and repellent, they're, they're, <laughs> there's going to be job loss. So you got to keep um, those mosquitoes. And the people who make those zappers, zzz, zzz, they're, they're out. Um, <laughs> can you think of uh, uh, a species that is endangered? That you know when it w- w- when we lose it. Um, you know, we're screwed. Like, 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 for example, sure. you know, I know if gazelles were extinct, we, it would impact lions, but what would it mean, you know, <laughs> if we lost like raccoons? Uh, is there, I mean, is there one where you go like this one is really gonna, and, and do they have lobbyists? <laughs> <laughs> I would- I would say that any one that you highlighted is going to have trickle down effects to that community and the other life that depend on that that species in the system. But the one I like to highlight globally, you know, for importance of human relevant to humanity is um, bees and pollination. Yeah. So we are, you know, rely upon bees every year to help pollinate the plants that enable us to survive. Whether you're talking about, um, you know, farm foods or foods that people are collecting from um, areas where they live. And that is an incredible service that relies upon the existence of bees. Can anybody um, so, replace them? Like, can we get the hummingbirds to step up their game? I don't think we're going to have hummingbirds stepping up our game to that one. And I'm not <laughs> sure if there's a close, I'm not sure if there's a close relative of the bee that's either that's going to step up yet either. Yeah. <laughs> At hope, the rate needed is really I, the point. I, I hope it's not murder hornets. Um, well, <laughs> there's either. one. Could we get rid of them and still be okay? I'm going to I'm going to opt out on voting for for elimination of certain species. Well, murder because hornets live, are invasive, right? Because you work in a rough business. So if <laughs> right, you would be you would be trolled and shit, right? You would be persecuted if you said a species is that is that correct? Well, I think the interesting point that I highlight is that a lot of times we don't even really know the extent of damage that comes from a loss of one species. So, I mean, let's point to viruses now because that's on everybody's mind. But, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we focus on the pathogenic viruses, the ones that cause us trouble and make us sick, right? But there are a lot of viruses in the world, um, more that we know of, more than than what we know of, um, that also have, you know, serve a function over time. Um, So, for example, like humans have evolved to um, be able to bear 
children with a placenta through a virus that eventually became part of our um, genetics. Um, viruses play an important role in our guts for um, processing food that we eat. So um, right now, I'm sure everyone has in mind we'd like to eliminate all viruses, but there's also a risk to that too. Like there's a, a lot out there that do more than, than what we really know on the positive side too. Oh, I had no idea there were good viruses. Back up. What's this placenta thing? <laughs> what did you say about oh my gosh. placenta? <laughs> so now you're, now you're going to go beyond. I'm an ecologist, but I am married to a medical doctor who works on. <laughs> can, can you put him on? <laughs> he's, he's with my toddler right now. <laughs> Listeners, wait a minute. This is a totally new concept to me. I, I won't push you on it knowing that you're not a virologist, uh, but the idea that there were good viruses, I, I, I don't think I ever understood that. So now, like, when the pandemic is over and you can go to somebody's house, you know, uh, you'll go, oh, I love what you've done the, with the living room. And people go, oh, it's uh, it's a new virus. I, I, I <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful and that's really, a beautiful lamp in the corner. That's a virus. It's a beautiful virus. I had no idea viruses did anything good. Yeah. Um, Just to give you a little taste of diversity, too. I mean, I will say that we're looking at one one coronavirus right now that's capturing our attention. And there's some 750 or so that have been documented in bats in China. And some experts estimate 10 to 15,000 of them out there in the world in terms of the diversity of um, coronaviruses. So, um, you know, in some ways, that's another look on what is biodiversity in a, in a virus realm. Oh there's gosh. a lot more out there. I feel so small right now. Uh, <laughs> well, you're bigger than a virus, although I, I, I was just interested in that whole thing about us having genes in common with viruses, because I'm convinced that my first college roommate was at least one quarter virus. Well, I, I, <laughs> I only wear Levi's. That's something I feel very strongly about. And okay. Gap. Um, so I don't have genes in common with that many people anymore. Um, uh <laughs> Well, you know, John Moyer said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Wow. Stay tuned to find out more about how we're all connected to the world around us. It's Jenga. The cat of the week is Cesar Catligula from Pleasanton, California. <laughs> No matter what 2021 brings, you can spend it creating something meaningful with Skillshare's online classes, because time is what we make of it. With Skillshare, you can find inspiration in the moment and learn how to express your creativity. Well, you know, Paula, as I told you a little while ago, I was using Skillshare to learn the basics of jazz piano, which is a, you know, a section of the piano skills universe that I didn't know much about, but I've just pivoted on my Skillshare adventure because for reasons that are really complicated, I now need to learn the computer language Python. And I've started taking Ooh. Python courses on Skillshare and they're easy, fun, and uh, the instructor has a really pleasing Irish accent. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish real growth. Explore your creativity at Skillshare.com slash Poundstone and get a free trial of premium membership. That's Skillshare.com slash Poundstone. And thank you, Skillshare, for sponsoring this episode and teaching me jazz piano and Python. Start the year off right with the newest Rothy styles like comfy shoes, brand new bags, and washable masks. So I have a pair of Rothy's, and I we recently had rain in Los Angeles. I'm sure you saw it trending on Twitter. And uh, I had on my fashionable, high-quality Rothy's, and I walked out in the backyard and sunk inches in mud. I brought them in, popped them in the washing machine, and you know what? You can put them in the washing machine. 
That's an amazing thing about them. They're, they've transformed over 70 million plastic bottles, by the way, Paula, into beautiful shoes, handbags, and face masks. Another major bonus, Rothy's are fully, well, we've said this, machine washable. Simply toss they them are. in like you did, and, and guess what? It's like getting a new pair of shoes. Yeah. You have to toss them in, by the way. You have to toss. You got to work on yeah, your you toss. Got, you, yeah, you got to toss. Yeah. Um, they, they are very comfortable and their flats, uh, I don't know if they all are, but the ones I have are, uh, and, um, and they're kind of, they're kind of pointy. It's like not the kind of shoe I would normally have, but I, but I, I chose them like trying to be a little kicky, trying to move out of my regular sneaker right. fashion and, mm-hmm. uh, and they're great. From Rothy's innovative manufacturing methods to their planet friendly materials, they consider sustainability every step of the way. Check out all the amazing shoes, bags, and masks available right now at rothys.com slash nobody. That's rothys.com, R-O-T-H-Y-S dot com slash nobody. Style and sustainability meet. To create your new favorites, head to rothys.com slash nobody right now. And we're back with ecologist Dr. Lauren E. Oaks. Lauren, um, all right, I confess that during the during the break we continued to talk, and you mentioned that um, biodiversity affects climate change. Am I yeah. am I am I saying that right, or is it climate change affects biodiversity? It's the other way around. Kind of both. Of- They're going hand in hand. <laughs> um, tell me how. Well, if you think about um, degradation as a main cause of what's um, driving a lot of these changes across the earth, and that's affecting biodiversity, that's affecting climate change, and it's also affecting our likelihood of disease emergence, like what we've seen in recent in the recent year. Um, but you can also think about biodiversity as this um, real positive, this ability um, it offers resilience. It offers an ability to deal with change. So if you have biodiversity, um, but uh, high biodiversity in ecosystems or high biodiversity across species or genetic biodiversity. Essentially, that's just a lot more uh, out there that can deal with a different kinds of changes. And so it gives um, species an ability to adapt and survive. So meaning that as climate change increases, that we won't get beaten down as badly if we have a stronger Correct. biodiversity? Is that Yeah, it's the- like a safeguard. It's like a natural safeguard that's already there um, and that some species may be hit harder than others. But um, others, depending on genetic variability or their um, tolerance for certain conditions, um, may be able to adapt or survive or endure those conditions better. Um, so it, it helps perpetuate um, life, really, to have that amount of the greatest diversity we can. It makes us more it, flexible. More flexible. And, you know, it's in the end, we're all playing the same game, which is, you know, survival of the fittest. So you get as much diversity out there and put a lot of challenging conditions out there in the world, which we're facing right now, um, it en- enables, you know, greater survival. Uh, now, I have roof rats. Is there any way we could get them on the extinction list? <laughs> I don't mean I don't mean the protection. I mean, just get rid of them. If we got rid of roof rats, would that put us in bad stead? Who eats rats? <laughs> Nobody eats rats, do they? Um, I'm going to, I, I, I'm going to stay out of the extinction <laughs> list. Yeah. You're, Paula, you're going to have a hard time convincing our, our good doctor to, to advocate for extinction of anything. I just, let's be realistic. If something has to go, <laughs> right. let's just have roof rats load it up. Um, we don't have to tell them. We can just say, <laughs> we can, we can just tell them to pack their things and be ready. Um, all right. How does a lack of diversity put us at risk for viruses, for, for bad viruses? Good one. Um, I'd reframe it a little bit and say, um, what happens when we step into these places that um, I, are biodiverse? Um, so if you think of some of the intact forests and ecosystems around the world as you know areas that have generally had relatively low human traffic or human activity. 
And you start to get people encroaching in those areas through degradation or going hunting or building roads or mines, whatever you want to put on that. Um, mm -hmm. And basically people are entering into these, what ecologists call it a disease ecology network, super nerdy word, or just like a, a viral ecosystem they haven't exposed, been exposed to before. So there's a lot more chances of interaction between wildlife that may be carrying viruses that people haven't been exposed to. Um, and the more interactions you have, the greater chances you have for something to jump over. And that's generally thought of as a rare event. Um, but um, a colleague and friend of mine, David Quammen, is a great writer, wrote a book called Spillover on disease emergence. And he says, you know, you look at a rare event, um, like rolling a dice and getting snake eyes, but if you roll the dice a ton of times, eventually you're going to get the snake eyes. And people expanding into areas where they haven't been previously is, is rolling the dice, is what you're saying, I think. Yeah, and interacting with animals or other life that they haven't before that may be carrying viruses um, that we then pick up. And if it ends up in one human, um, that's a spillover. And if it's an, that human then is able to transmit that to another human, that's an outbreak. Um, right. And if you go national and multinational and world, then we're at pandemic. So you're saying but I that, should stop dating this bat? Yes, don't date the bat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can make um, do, that promise. We, we're in love. I, do we know for sure that... Is that just uh, urban lore, or do we know that this came from a bat, by the way? So that scientists are still figuring out, though they do um, point to bats as most likely at this point. I don't think we have an exact um, uh, answer on that. But It's not Hilda. She's clean. <laughs> I will say that it's definitely known that bats tend to uh, harbor an enormous number of viruses. Um and so a lot of these, uh, um, a number of other viruses, these are called zoonotic if they've um, transferred over, um, come from, have come from bats. So, so it is a likely place to look for, to look. And do the viruses do the bats any harm? Uh, good question. You know, I don't actually know the answer for what we're experiencing right now. Um, but I certainly know that other viruses like white nose syndrome is a good one that's uh, often given an example that have taken out whole bat colonies. Um, white nose syndrome? Yeah, and I don't, yeah, that's another, oh. that's another disease that infects, um, virus that, that, that infects bats and is carried in bats and has wiped out whole colonies of bats. Oh, wow, white um, nose syndrome. So they get white noses and then they die? You're going beyond my knowledge again, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you knew it was called white nose syndrome, so I had to ask. Um. <laughs> but I'd say that, um, I mean, in some ways, sure, it's a terrifying thing to look at, you know, what's happening in terms of um, degradation across the planet and what we're living right now in terms of um, COVID-19. But we can also look and say there's an enormous amount of, you know, intact areas around the world still, you know, 40% of our intact ecosystems are, are highly intact and doing well. And those are in parts of Canada and Russia and the Amazon and central Africa and New Guinea. Um, and those are places that we can look to and work to protect, to help climate change, to help biodiversity, to help reduce the likelihood of another event like this. Um, that kind of, um, action, both in, protecting those places, restoring them in some places, minimizing our activity in them can do a lot on, on some of the biggest crises we're facing today. New Guinea? I, I think that's, isn't that where the, the, in Swiss Family Robinson, isn't that where they were on their way to? Um, <laughs> I, I haven't gotten to Swiss Family Robinson with my little kiddo yet, so it's not so fresh in my mind. But oh yeah, I think they were trying to. I think they were on a ship trying to go to New Guinea, and then and then they. By the way, they ended up on an island that had tremendous biodiversity, um, and then they they stayed there and probably fucked it up. But that would be in the sequel <laughs> where you really knew about that part. Um, they it was yeah. New Guinea. I googled it. Did you? Oh, for God's <laughs> sakes, Tony. <laughs> Paula, Tony consistently provides you with information that you want, and you object to the method with which she gets it. I just want her to focus. And she, <laughs> if, if she would focus, then she would be 
then she would be the part of the book club that was reading the book. Right. Instead of the part of the book club that it just just firmly said she won't. Um. Let's, let's talk about actions for a second. Can you um, – is there something you can do for ecosystems besides not killing stuff? Like we talk about invasive species, but like are – are there things that you can bring into an ecosystem to help heal it? Yeah, great question. Um, so this this start of the year is the um, launch of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Um, so that's a, a global movement, really. Wait to a minute. When did we start that? When did that happen? Month, January. Oh, for God's sake! You didn't get your card, Paul. I know. I said, I said I've everybody cards. left out of stuff. Oh, oh, Jesus! I don't even have my outfit yet. Um, what is it called again? The UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. But the real real celebration for the opening with all kinds of plans will be in June. So you have a little time. Oh, good. I'm gonna get it. <laughs> yeah, just pick pick out a nice frock, Paula. But go go yeah. ahead and tell us tell us about that and 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 what we can be doing. Um, yeah, to, I mean, I think we've them. spent. I feel like we spent a couple of decades looking at degradation and deforestation around the planet, but there's also a huge movement to restore ecosystems and to replant forests. Um, so this UN decade um, kind of emerged out of an, an already existing movement where governments around the world have been uh, ramping up tree planting and restoration activities. Um, and now this is, you know, when it, when it becomes a UN decade, my understanding is everybody's really serious about it and has got goals over the next 10 years. And they do have goals, um, you know, largely looking at restoring um, an area around basically the size of India around the planet. Um, and a lot of that can occur through planting, through natural regeneration, through um, changing our land use so that, you know, we have a mix of both agricultural practices and um, forests that we're protecting and planting and restoring. Is it mostly um, planting, thinking that, like, if we plant it, they will come? Or are you are you trucking animals in, too? Um, mostly planting, you're correct. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely um, some uh, examples of smaller projects I've been exposed to through my work where um, organizations are trying to move species to areas where they may be more likely to survive in light of future climate. Um, but the planting initiatives are really a recognition of these ecosystems provide, you know, not just the habitat for wildlife, but also protection of water resources, um, services oh, yeah. in terms of, you know, reducing our effects on climate change and sequestering carbon. Um, there's you know, gotta the be a, there's gotta be a place where roof rats could thrive better than they're able to here. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to put them on the list. To Maybe we can moved. find a, a place for them. Um, what's There's your stand? A... There's a place for rats. For rats somewhere, a place for rats. Not you on know, my roof. Uh, <laughs> I feel bad that we are reading Moby Dick while I'm talking to someone about biodiversity. So I want you to know that as soon as we finish Moby Dick, we're going to read that that compelling novel, um, Dicky Mob, uh, which is about um, seamen that take whales <laughs> from the land and put them back in the ocean. There's so much uh, wrong with what you just said. I <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I have to ask you about uh, what's your stand on uh, Colombia and Mexico's cocaine hippos. Oh well, we are Adam. I'm gonna. Tell, I don't have a reply there. There's oh, not. You, you, there's you no such thing. Oh, there is. I read an amazing thing about it recently, which is I like, re remember the drug lord. Uh, I think it was Escobar was his name, Pablo Escobar. Yes. So apparently, he brought in just for fun. Uh, one male and three female hippos, you know, because he liked a lot of biodiversity on his giant estate. Um, but, you know, they, they were released into the wild because nobody knows how to move a hippo. And now there's like hundreds of hippos down there messing with the ecosystem. Oh. Huh. I never heard of that. Huh. I didn't Did you ever know hear that. of that, I, Lauren? I haven't heard of that one, no. Yeah. Oh. Huh. Well, look, look into cocaine hippos. It's It's really interesting <laughs> stuff. <laughs> That's I'm going to pause and Google that now. Just hold on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I swear to God, I didn't make that one up. They're the ones with the straws in their noses. They're easily sighted. <laughs> Never had that one in an interview before. 
That's good, <laughs> noting it. Uh, <laughs> Lauren, are there organizations that we can turn people on to that are working, uh, you know, to strengthen biodiversity? Definitely. Um, there's a lot of players out there, which is also really exciting because this movement is only growing. Um, in terms of planting trees, 1T.org is a good one to look at. It's kind of a platform for many different organizations that are involved. Um, Trillion Trees uh, is another. The Wildlife Conservation Society, where I work, um, is also involved in restoration initiatives. But uh, there's a program called the Health, Health Program, One Health, which is really looking to recognize everything we've talked about here, the inherent connections between people all other wildlife, all their life, and viruses and diseases that are out there, too. Great. Also, um, SwissFamilyRobinson.org, but that, I don't know if they're still up. Um, uh, (laughs) (laughs) Tony's going to Google that. I know it. Uh, Well, thank you very much. Yeah, Um, that was fantastic. Good. I'm glad we have that uh, so that listeners can can know that those are places where they can uh, uh, get information, perhaps donate, and feel like they're part of the solution. Me too. Thank you. And now we're going to take all that information you gave us and run it through the old pounce-tonator. Paula? Okay. House band, Fiddler David Bragger. If you could give me a little a little background music, I'll tell you what the pounce-tonator spit out. It's a passage from Dickie Moab. What are you about there, harpooner? Put that pointy piece of iron down. You're destroying the biodiversity of this here earth, which will cause calamitous viruses and climate change, man. Aye, aye, sir. But not all viruses are bad. Look, you barnacle second land lubber. That may jolly be well, but there are bad ones like COVID-19 that can devastate the human population, stir up the selfish bastards who won't wear masks, and fill the treasure chest of the likes of Jeff Bezos. We've got rats on ship, sir. <laughs> Harpoon them, me mateys. What about the biodiversity, sir? They're rats, you blubber-headed skellywag. Throw them overboard. But save the white one for me. She's an ecologist whose latest book is In Search of the Canary Tree. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Lauren E. Oaks, everybody. Thanks, Lauren. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Lauren, you were fantastic. Lauren, thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, Great great conversation. Many laughs. And I'm going to go look up cocaine hippos. (laughs) Great. (laughs) (laughs) So sorry I wasn't up to speed. (laughs) <laughs> no, 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 no regrets there. Coming up, mailbag. Nobody's have a lot to tell us, including a theory about the mystery star that Bonnie Burns showered with. That's coming up right after this, as long as we're talking about <laughs> biodiversity. Hey, Paula, when you use the bathroom, you always close the door behind you, right? I live alone. Okay. You don't want random (laughs) passerby looking in on you, though, do you? (laughs) I don't. I do not. I'm clear about that. So so why would you let people look in on you when you go online? Using the internet without ExpressVPN is like going to the bathroom and not closing the door. Did you know that your internet service provider knows every single website you visit? And what's worse is they can sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who will use your data to target you. ExpressVPN puts a stop to this. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet so that your online activity can't be seen by anyone. Yeah, I don't know about you, Paula, but I use ExpressVPN on all my devices because it works on everything. Phones, laptops, even routers. So everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can still be protected even if they don't have ExpressVPN. And the best part is using ExpressVPN is as easy as closing the bathroom door, which, Paula, you should do. You just fire up the app, click one button, and you're protected. I use it on my toaster oven. I use it on my alarm clock. I use it on my, uh, what do you call it, disc player. ExpressVPN is the world's number one rated VPN by CNET, Wired, The Verge, and countless others. So if you're like me and believe your online activity is your business, 
Secure yourself by visiting expressvpn.com slash poundstone today. Use our exclusive link. I mean, please, expressvpn.com slash poundstone, and you can get an extra three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash poundstone. That's a good deal. We all have memories and experiences from childhood that shaped who we are today. I mean, Paulo, what were yours? What what, what shaped you? Oh, you know what? I I got, for my fifth birthday, a little Uh set of pots and pans. Like little pots and pans. And uh, I played with those things for hours and hours and hours. Uh, I, I mean, I, that's a big chunk of my life was I had a cardboard box that my sisters drew magic marker, um, heating coils on and, uh, I cooked up a storm. It's hard to find new creative ways to keep the kids busy while stretching their brain. I don't know if you want to stretch their brain, but KiwiCo does the legwork for you. So you can spend more quality time tackling projects together. And I have been tackling projects, and I love it when these Kiwi Co. crates arrive because just the shape of the outside of the box, just the, the pattern on it lets, lets my daughter um, Vivian know that we've got something. And recently we did these make-it-yourself friction climbers, which are essentially little wooden toys that use friction to climb up a rope. It seems It seems counterintuitive, but it does happen, and we built it together, and it was fantastic. So it's little wooden things that climb up a rope? Yeah, little wooden toys that can climb up a rope through the use of friction. Oh, that's a great life's lesson for a kid. You know, you say to them, don't leave your rope out or wooden things will climb up it. Well, I got to tell you, Paula, if you if you um, if you didn't have friction, you wouldn't be climbing ropes like you do. Oh, no. Oh, no. I love friction. I (laughs) it's just I'm just tired of you. I'm just tired of everybody bad mouthing friction around here. (laughs) No, I love friction. I Okay, see I was that you do. A, I was raised in a family. What's a family without friction, for God's sakes? Encourage oh, your are. children to be innovators <laughs> and creative thinkers. They won't believe what they can build and accomplish with KiwiCo. And when they're finished, watch their confidence be as big as their smile. KiwiCo is redefining learning with hands-on projects that build confidence, creativity, and critical thinking skills. There's something for every kid or kid at heart. At KiwiCo, get 30% off your first month plus free shipping on any crate line with code Paula at KiwiCo.com. And the friction? That's free. That's 30% off your first (laughs) month at KiwiCo.com. Promo code Paula. Stress, sleep, recovery. These things shape how we perform. Um, in the most recent stressful months with, with all that's been going on in our country and everything, I was having a hard time sleeping. And one night uh, I, I reached out and used my new calm thing, really convinced that I wasn't going to get to sleep. And the next morning I marveled. Um, you know, I, I, I don't even remember what all was there. I just pushed it on, on my phone. There was some kind of relaxing, there was some kind of relaxing music. And, and the next thing I knew, um, (laughs) I was waking up after a good night's sleep. Well, that's amazing. Well, you know, stress is unavoidable and it's imperative to your health and happiness to be able to manage stress and not be managed by it. New calm is gives you the power to slow down and get some distance, which will allow you to respond better to the demands of everyday life. New Calm accomplishes this by interrupting acute stress at its source and by bringing you into the calming brainwave patterns that are associated with relaxation, greater awareness, intuition, and provide a calming sensation. Newcom is clinically proven in over 1 million sessions to improve your sleep, reduce your stress, and boost your recovery Without drugs and side effects, Paula Poundstone. That must have been what I had. I must have had calming brainwave patterns. There you go, yeah. The new calm system uses cutting-edge neuroscience and consists of three non-invasive and non-pharmaceutical items, all of which are included in your monthly subscription that costs less than a daily cup of coffee. By the way, 
Maybe if you got rid of the coffee, that could be a step. You wouldn't need the new calm. Who's just saying the whole process is easy to use and to work into your daily routine to achieve better sleep, reduction in stress, and boost in recovery. Do what I did. Own the day with new calm and make 2021 the year you manage your stress better. We have a special link set up specifically for our listeners. Uh, so if you're going to try this anyways, do it and use our code because we get the benefit from that. Go to <laughs> paulanewcom.com and get 50% off your 30-day subscription of Newcom and their money-back guarantee. That's Paula, N-U-C-A-L-M dot com. Paula, N-U-C-A-L-M dot com. Feeling calm? So am I. I'm very calm right now. Me too. Fun fact, the White House in Washington, D.C. has 132 rooms, including 35 bathrooms, which nowadays are once again referred to as bathrooms and not tweetatoriums. <laughs> All right, and now everybody, mailbag! Thank you, Paula. Nobody's... Thank you for writing and sharing your thoughts and opinions and questions and general weirdness. And we're going to have uh, Tony Nita Hull step up to the old microphone and share some of them with us right now. These are things that you sent to our Facebook page or that you've emailed to us. Once again, that address is nobody listens to Paula Poundstone at gmail.com. Tony Nita Hull! I'm here. I'm ready. All right. She's Stop ready. I can't believe it. Oh, fuck. Oh my God. You know, I get nervous, and yeah, I move off yeah, well, the pink one and onto the orange one. It's a tough part. But Tony, Tony, let's get started with mailbag. Go ahead, Tony. Go oh, ahead. Okay. So we have from <laughs> Alicia. Are you expecting Shaw. the extended remix of the of the theme song. There? I don't know. I wasn't sure. Um. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is from nobody in particular, Alicia Schuff. Dear Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone, I would like to commend Paula Poundstone on her much improved glockenspiel performance in your most recent podcast. I think the key to consistently good performance may be knowing what note to strike first. Might I suggest oh, marking yeah. it with a Sharpie? I do enjoy the suspense of not knowing if she will... Um, be happy with the first try. So I promise to continue to listen in any case. Thanks for the many laughs. Well, wow. I just want to say this. Um, <laughs> I have, I have made sharpie marks on the keys, and I still <laughs> fuck it up. Yeah, I still screw it up all the time. Uh. <laughs> And, uh, I, uh, I, I have a I have a very cryptic uh, markings on the uh, uh, on the keys. Um, They're color coded. You just need to start with pink, right? Uh, no. When I say mailbag, oh shit! Oh <laughs> <laughs> no! In uh, fact, it's uh, orange and and green. Orange green. Okay. Okay. I skip right over the purple. Right, but you know, but, uh, you can't put um you can't do sharpie marks on all of them because the mailbag theme is very different from your the from your vocabulary song <laughs> theme. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a lot of good musicians do use color coding. Um <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know if you guys saw Bruce Springsteen at the inauguration, but you could see his lips moving sometimes, saying uh -huh. orange, green, red. Oh, yeah, when he was singing that song at the inauguration on the yeah. steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. Yeah, I, I yeah. didn't see that, but I'm, I'm sure you're right, Paul. You must be. Um, yeah, he sings, but then uh, underneath <laughs> it, you can still see his lips moving, and he's not, and then he's not. Uh, oh, wait, that was wrong. Uh, and he's not, uh, it, it's different lyrics. He sings the lyrics and then he mouths the colors. 
Interesting. You know, to Tony, you don't just get to say that you're not going to read Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> That is the assignment in the book club is reading Moby Dick. I'm and gonna your fellow read it. Club members are depending on you can listen to it. I'll come read it I, to you. How about that? With a mask. Sounds good. I, I will finish Moby Dick, I promise. Yeah. Bullshit. No, I will. I will. Well she well, will. Well, it- I believe you'll read Moby Dick, but I'd rather at the moment that you that you read the next entry from our mailbag. So, Mrs. Culpepper has been getting some fan mail, and I thought we should pay her um, the respect um, of reading them. So, here well, we go. Well, I love that idea, Tony and Nita Holt. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. Of course. Welcome, Mrs. Culpepper. Course, Mrs. Tony's Culpepper. going to read these right now. And Tony, yeah. I'm happy to I'm happy to read aloud to you, Moby Dick, at any time you'd like. I've read it over and over again. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Culpepper. I really appreciate that. <laughs> it would be my um, pleasure, Tony. Of course. The first your first fan is Jana. Dear Paul and Adam, I love Mrs. Culpepper. I would love to hear her regularly on the show. I imagine her having a weekly segment in which she gives etiquette advice that is sometimes on point and sometimes ridiculously outdated. Am I the only nobody who loves Mrs. Culpepper and Adam playing off of each other? Well, oh. Jenna, I hope you're not the only nobody who loves Mrs. Culpepper as well. That would be that would be uh, ter- I, 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 Anybody who says it is a damnable comedy. Co- Calumny. 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 A damnable calumny. Absolutely. And Mrs. Culpepper, um, I love you too. And and I I can tell you that everybody, um, everybody who listens to the show probably loves you almost as much, but of course couldn't love you as much as your husband does. The Captain Culpepper. Well, he did uh, love me very much, uh, uh, Adam. Did he stop loving you? Well, no, it's not that. He did not uh, cease to love me. He, he ceased to breathe. Oh. <laughs> oh, I must have known that and somehow forgotten. I'm terribly sorry I believe for that. we have been over it before, yes. I, I believe. <laughs> Apparently, I, it, uh, it's an evanescent thought for you, Adam Felber. I guess it is. I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your loss. Um, you know, it, that happens to men of action like Captain Culpepper who go to many battles. I, I, I am sorry, though. Well, it wasn't. Uh, he was not killed in battle, actually. Uh, he was killed uh, at uh, wine and cheese uh, 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 fundraiser. Oh, <laughs> by an old rival, no doubt. Uh, well, no, in fact, it was uh, uh, the uh, he had uh, t- uh, taro t- Tarotoxism. Oh, that's a poisoning from cheese or dairy products, isn't it? Well, I've forgotten now. Was it tryo or taro? I, I tyro. Think it's, I think it's tyro. It was, it was tyro. tyro. It was, it was many years had, ago, clearly. It was so long ago, and it's an evanescent <laughs> thought in my own head at this point. <laughs> uh, it was tyro, tyrotoxism. Yes, it was a tragic, tragic, which is the poisoning from... Uh, uh, cheese or other dairy products. That is correct. Ah, so I'm sure it was some other dairy product that did him in. It was a cheese. In fact, it was the uh, Gouda that got him, now that you mention it. <laughs> oh, suddenly <laughs> I remember this story. <laughs> All right, well, Miss Culpepper, coming, I'm sorry to make you revisit that. It's coming back to you now. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would hope so. <laughs> uh, uh, Miss Culpepper, as long as you're here, Tony, read her another email, would you? Yeah, this is from Keith Zeller. Hey, all started listening almost two months ago, and I'm up to episode 76. You've helped me get through the 2020 blues, especially Mrs. Culpepper. Um, could you ask her for an autographed photo for me, please? If it's not too much trouble, I prefer one of her in her ruby sateen gown. Love you guys. Keith. Oh, Keith, I'm so moved. Uh, that is so kind of you. I I I, I thought that no one uh, remembered my ruby satin dress, and m- m- Captain Culpepper loved to see me in my ruby satin dress, and I'm wearing it now. I'd be happy to send you a, a, an autographed photo. 
Oh, that's so nice. So you're you're wearing it right now. I'm sure the captain will enjoy it later tonight. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, 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 I understand that uh, you you keep forgetting about the way that Captain Culpepper expired. <laughs> or even the fact of it, yes. And I, I do apologize for that. That last one was over the line. And uh, please accept my apologies, uh, Mrs. Well, Culpepper. As you know, you remain, you remain ever in my thoughts fondly. Yeah, well, apparently Captain Culpepper does not remain so much in your thoughts. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I, I, th- I, th- I thank you. Uh, All right. You know what I was, I was thinking, uh, w- w- one thing that we might uh, uh, enjoy... Uh, nobody listening to Paula Poundstone would be a theme song for Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what? We've had such a great theme song contest. Um, if you have a Moby Dick related song that you want to um, write, record, and send to us, why well, we'd be accepting of that and probably play it on our show. <laughs> That's a great idea, Ms. Or a book club Moby theme song. Dick. Just a theme song for our book Moby club segment. Moby Dick. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good one, Ms. Culpepper. Let's uh, hear some more of that. Well, I don't know. You know, I'm going to tell you, so I hope uh, I'm speaking a little bit out of class here, and I apologize for that, but Tony Anita Hull has read Eat, Pray, Love more than once. <laughs> is that true? It is true. <laughs> it's tragic. That's what it is. It's tragic. Oh, God. <laughs> So, so eat, pray, love, and Cosmo, yes. Moby Dick, not so much. I, uh, Paula calls it eat, pray, fuck. Okay. Wait, what? Well, I, it's nothing I would ever say, but Paula Poundstone calls that book eat, pray, fuck. You ju- you just said it twice, uh, Mrs. Culpepper. Oh, not in such a way you'll remember. That's true. Um, uh, okay, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> okay. Um, the- <laughs> Mailbag! <laughs> okay, okay. So... Um- <laughs> Okay, um, so the, the choice of Moby Dick was quite divisive. I can't do this. If you, if, you can't, if you can't push through it, she's going to keep doing it, don't you? I know. Um, so the choice of Moby Dick was divisive among nobodies. Um, a lot of people want us to read Good Omens. A handful, um, Daring Greatly by Brene Brown on vulnerability. And then um, a few wanted the power broker. And this comes from a loyal nobody in Akron who is hoping we choose the power broker. Um, Wait a minute. Aren't so for- these all your suggestions? Weren't these all yours? The these power woo-woo broker books? wasn't mine. No, you, the woo-woo you- book. Okay. Brene Brown you, is not woo-woo. <laughs> you wanted us to read woo-woo books about vulnerability and and inner child. Right. But the yeah. power broker was Ken Lezebnik's suggestion Nick's, about um, yes. about um, – uh, Robert Moses, I believe. Yes. It was a, th- it was a like, it was a two thousand page book about a guy in New York, <laughs> so that Ken could continue his his falsehood about being in Brooklyn. That's what it was. Yeah, b- but instead we got a two thousand page book about whales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is much better. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> okay, Tony, you want to read that? Um, want to read yes. that? We're we're in our mailbag. Okay, so folks, this is from a loyal nobody in Akron, I believe. Um, Listening to your podcast today, I so wanted you to choose the power broker for your book club. I'm on page 411. Great book. Tony Anita Hall should take it on her next COVID cruise. A fine book to have when she's quarantined for two weeks after the ship docks. (laughs) And Chris Hemsworth (laughs) stars in the movie version of Heart of the Sea, based on the brilliant book about the true story that inspired Moby Dick. Captain Crinkle might find him acceptable for shower purposes. Keep up your comedy <laughs> chaos. It is much appreciated. Oh, yeah. We did, I, he, he's got all the bases covered, this Akron guy. He knows a lot about us. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, clearly. He's 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 definitely up on what we do. Yeah. Um Tony, are there any books about is there anything could we compromise? Are there any books we could read about the vulnerabilities of whaling <laughs> ship guys? Listen. <laughs> Honestly, what is going on here? And and then there was Mrs. Culpepper criticizing her for eat pray love. Paula, apparently you call it eat pray fuck? I do. I haven't read it. I, just, I, I think I just saw I just saw clips of the movie, and it was just painful. Oh, okay. And okay. just the fact that so many women wanted to read it, I, I don't know. It bothered me. <laughs> and the title bothers me. Um, I just shit, I did I, quit my time. To- I did quit my job at the New York Times to travel because I read that book. <laughs> did that book tell you to quit your job at the New York Times? No, but I wanted you... to like go on a journey to like find myself abroad. Oh, for Christ's sakes! <laughs> how do you know? You right, won't, but, but how do you know you won't it. find? Wait, how do you know you won't find yourself in the Target? Why do you need a journey, <laughs> right? What, how do you know you might just find yourself? I don't know in the backyard in the laundry room. You, you don't know. I, I, I know. I, I, I was young and stupid. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's. <laughs> You're well, let's so not really read about young. it now. All right. I want to get to the last thing. The the elephant in the room here. Um, (laughs) Bonnie Burns, two questions. Would you shower with Chris Hemsworth? And is he the actor that you showered with? No. (laughs) Would you wouldn't shower with him, though? It seems like a multi-purpose no. It's a multi-purpose no. You wouldn't shower with Chris Hemsworth? Holy shit, Bonnie. I would shower with Chris Hemsworth. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's too young for me. Oh. What? Oh. Huh. Right. Would would oh. the Bonnie Burns who showered with that actor that we haven't figured out yet in the 90s have showered with Chris Hemsworth? I don't know. The guy in the 90s, it's like the whole package, how smart he was, how great he was, how sensitive, how everything. I don't know if Chris Hemsworth has that going for him. How smart well, is he? Uh, wh- What's why don't you talk about this guy's talents? Like, what were his talents? Um, I, I, I think you mentioned something about a musical, right? You're not getting it out of me, Adam. So okay, forget wait. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> I have a question. Is it possible that this guy starred in a movie uh, that became a trilogy, (laughs) but that he was only in the first of the three, and he was in New York, and he had some sons, and people swam with the fishes? Is that possible? I, that's oh, possible. That's very possible. Here. Yeah. Oh. So you slept with oh. Marlon Brando. You took a shower with Marlon Brando. <laughs> I said it was a hunk. He was a hunk. He was <laughs> several hunks. <laughs> was a Mrs. hunk in Mrs. the Mrs. 50s. Brando loved him. Um, <laughs> he, was in a hunk, he was a hunk in the 50s. Okay, do you That's remember true. being in the shower and saying, hey, look, Marlon, we're swimming with the fishes. Do you remember that? I could have been a contender. Could have been a contender. <laughs> I, do you remember what being I in, the shower, in, in the shower with Marlon and saying, hey, there's no room in the shower for me? <laughs> <laughs> I remember this, being this in was the shower the with Marlon and he farted. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a story is that to tell uh <laughs> uh tony i suspect there's got to be at least one more uh, uh message there in that is, bag for us in the mailbag is... oh, shit wait i put my hold just hold on i'm i'm going back to the instrument room <laughs> your conservatory my uh <laughs> the, my the poundstone conservatory <laughs> All right, Tony, what else is in that mailbag? So we had a lot of a lot of nobody's guess who Bonnie Shower partner 
was. Wow. Had, there was John Travolta, is- Victor Garber. Um, uh, what's his Victor face? Victor Garber? Oh, Jerry Orbach. That's the other one I'm thinking of. So, and then. Um, Bonnie hates that one. <laughs> she does. It's a very sensitive subject with her. So um, this guy had his own He guests. wore a raincoat in the shower. Jerry Orbach did. <laughs> <laughs> a big trench coat, yeah. <laughs> and he called it a Mackinac. Um, <laughs> I think it was Vincent Gardenia. That is... <laughs> Now you're going to say Zero Mustel. Possibly, <laughs> was it? No. You know who it could have been, though? The guy in... Um, well, wait. Wouldn't you know? What was it? Nine and a half. You know, he's yes. kind of... Uh, Mickey Rourke? Hispanic or something. Land, help me out. The guy... Uh, you guy, Tony. You know who I mean. It's... Um, in nine and a half weeks? Um, is he in Antonio nine. Banderas? I said Mickey Rourke. Who? No, not Mickey Rourke. He's it, like, oh, he's he's not Hispanic. He might be Puerto Rican. He's oh, Mickey, he's right on the tip of my tongue. He's an Mickey actor Rooney? too. Is it Mickey Rooney? Not Mickey <laughs> Rooney. I said he's dark complected. It's like the guy who's married to Melanie Why are you suggesting who it could have been when you showered with the man? (laughs) No, I'm saying for It's weird for you to be guessing. A good guess. Who was the guy in nine? Who was the guy in nine? What was nine? nine. Oh, the... the... Oh, um... Not Antonio Banderas. You mean the musical based on Fellini's Eight and a Half? Yeah, but it's like the guy married to Melanie Griffith, but not that guy. A guy who okay. does Antonio musicals. Banderas. Yeah, but not oh, him. But, oh, but like no. that so he's like Tony Antonio Danza. Banderas. Was it, was it Tony Danza? No. <laughs> it's totally Tony Danza. <laughs> no, come on, land. And Tony, you're musical I'm, people. I'm wasn't it? Wasn't it Chachi? It was Chachi. <laughs> it was Chachi. Andy Garcia. No, that's not a bad guess, but... No, you're Wait, just going to be like... Wait, but you know who it was. You're <laughs> asking us to guess who is like the person who it is. No, I'm telling you who would have been a good guess. Oh, for God's sakes. <laughs> but it's not a good guess because it's not that person. Oh, my gosh. Oh. All right. Who was Daniel the... Day-Lewis? Okay. Uh, you know, it's not fair to take up the nobody's time like this. Your guys' okay, time, you... that's something else. But their time, <laughs> All right, Tony, not that Tony read, the, read the email that you were okay. going to read, whatever it was. Okay, this is from a BC, just initials only there. Um, BC? Uh, BC. I'm a gay man. After I heard Bonnie's tale of her hookup with Robert Preston, I had a wet dream with Bonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> BC, I love you. Um. <laughs> so, Captain, Captain, Captain Crinkle is no longer Captain Crinkle. She's Madam Librarian. <laughs> oh, my God. Robert Preston. I don't even think Robert Preston lived into the 90s. I know. How could they come up with that? No, he did. He came back. <laughs> did he? Yeah, he came back as Tony Danza. It was Tony Danza, wasn't it? Right. It was not Tony it was Danza. Chachi. And let me it's let, let me tell you, in that shower, she's the boss. <laughs> was it, wait, who was the one? No, who was the one? Joni loves that Chachi. Was good, who, was, Adam. who was Scott Chachi? Bayo. Thank Scott you, Bonnie. Bayo. Scott, Scott Bayo. Bayo. That's who it was. That's no, who it was. Bonnie we can't loves do that Chachi. To Bonnie. No. You're trying to get us to remember the name of somebody that you would have showered with but didn't. <laughs> I know. This That's is just so fucking crazy. We were doing charades. <laughs> this has gone on longer than charades. Yeah, I know. We are. I am now officially bringing down the curtain, thanking you all okay. on mailbag. It's fair. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Paula, what is going on in your Poundstone product empire this week besides the search for Bonnie's shower partner? Oh, wait. Um... Oh, wait. 
Bonnie, how large was the shower head? <laughs> <laughs> That's a clue. That's an important clue. No, yeah. No, what? it's how high was the shower head? Hmm. Then you'd know no. how tall he was. Oh, I thought maybe oh boy. maybe you just reached up with a watering can. Uh, Adam. <laughs> yes. It has come to our attention here at Poundstone Industries that cats across the nation are crying out for Poundstone pussy pillows. The catnip filled four by five inch pillows with a cat joke on one side and autographed to one's cat on the other and with a grommet at the top so you can tie it to a string and drag it. The pussy pillow, not the cat. And it's made by a <laughs> pillow maker who has not lost their Twitter account for spreading dangerous lies on the platform. It's a win-win meow. Poundstone Pussy Pillows <laughs> are available at the store at paulapoundstone.com. And while I'm at it, I'll ask Heidi's indulgence to mention that the store also carries audio on CD, that is, and paperback versions of my book, The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. I, I love doing the dishes while listening to a book on the boombox in my kitchen. That's all I can tell you for now, because Heidi. Understood. And now that the Super Bowl's over, I don't have anything in particular to promote this week, Paula. I've got a lot of exciting projects in the works, but um, for now, nothing. Okay, huh? wait, I have something. <gasps> Bonnie Burns has something to promote. Yeah, Bonnie's, <laughs> it's, it's Captain Crinkle's yeah. sh soap on a rope. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> as, the, as the soap wears down, it reveals the person she showered with underneath it. Yeah. That's so I funny. love the idea of Bonnie doing a video podcast of her interviewing somebody in a shower. That's yeah. just like the greatest idea ever. That is sort of a good idea. It might be. That is a funny idea. It would be hard to hear, though. Well, you know, Kim <laughs> Kardashian. <it's... laughs> You're right. You're right. You guys would have to shout above the white noise of the shower, but it would be really worth it. A sex. Kim Kardashian, that's how she started was a sex video. Okay, well, guess what? It's not really promotion. I just want to tell you that the guy's name I was trying to think of is Raul Julia. And here's the really sad part. He died. He's dead. <laughs> so, well, I'm so glad so wait, you stopped so wait, you us to tell us that. To, <laughs> you, you interrupted to lie about a promotion that you had so that you could tell us <laughs> that you did not sleep with Raul Julia but would have but now can't because he's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Sane. That would have been... A good guess. <laughs> this just in, ladies and, and gentlemen. And I didn't know another time to get it into that conversation. I don't know if this should be. Uh, see what people see the lengths people will go to to not shower with you. Now I, I, I don't know if this. <laughs> he was. He was. He was fine when he was in my tub. Um, I. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if this should be a segment, a regular segment, or just a mini podcast of um, dead people who Bonnie Burns can't shower with. Mini, but what else? Mini sound, mini sound. <laughs> yeah, a thousand I'm just, percent. I'm just having it's, the greatest It's from a show time called ever. Tragic Suds. <laughs> Tragic Suds. This just in: Bonnie Burns would have showered with Raul Julia, but can't. Wow. Whew. All right, everybody, subscribe to this podcast. It's free, and it should be. You'll get it every week at no charge. If you want to send us an email, whether it's a show description or a theme song or a book club song, we're at nobody listens to Paula Poundstone at gmail.com. Once again, that that's nobody listens to Paula Poundstone at gmail.com, and that's our show. Nobody listens to Paula Poundstone is hosted. By Paula Poundstone and yours truly, Adam the Felber. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Lauren E. Oaks. You were great, Lauren. Thank you. Ooh. And to our house band, David Bragger. 
Our show is produced by Paula Poundstone, Adam Felber, Bonnie Burns, Ken Lezebnik, and Tony Anita Hull. Mixing by Michael Hoagie. Starburns production by Land Romo. Transcription services for the show provided by Transcribe Me, a premier internationally used transcription service. Use code Paula Poundstone when placing your order at transcribeme.com to receive an expedited service. You know, uh, I was on a bus a while ago. You have a That's Our Show thing to do. Oh, sorry. Uh, That's our show for tonight. Won't somebody please listen to me? (laughs) All right, now we get to mutter. (laughs) Yeah. I was on a bus a little while ago, and somebody sitting across the way from me just kept staring at me and staring at me. And finally, I talked to them for a second, and it turns out they work for Transcribe Me. And um, so they've been transcribing um, conversations about who Bonnie Burns showers with. And, <laughs> and do they have theories? I mean, it this was is just, like... like, I'm not going to be able to take that bus anymore. That's what I'm saying. It's wow. just too if awkward. You're, if you're transcribing these conversations, that's got to be like the Zebruder film at this point. Yeah. Yeah, they had a whole who do, scroll who do, who, of names who do you they think wanted it was, to run Paula? past me. Who yeah, do you think it was? They, you know, here's, I gotta tell you something. I've known Bonnie for a long time, and she doesn't sure. have a shower. <laughs> Starbanks Avenue, a, podca- <clears throat> a podcast network. Stereo is a free live broadcast social platform that enables people to have real conversations in real time. Listen to this. This is a clip from an earlier. A stereo conversation between me and Adam Felber and our listeners. Alberta, you're on the line. My prediction for 2021 is fucking zombies. <laughs> wow. Really? Now, I'm going to ask never... for clarification here because are you predicting that there's going to be zombies? You know, fucking zombies? Or are you predicting that people are going to be fucking zombies? That's what it sounded like. And I thought to myself, I've really never lusted after a zombie before. But uh, <laughs> we can kill each other. That I, I, I'm not going to fuck a zombie, but, uh, you know, but I'd be happy to, to chat. Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone is excited to offer our listeners a new way to interact with us. To find out about the day and time, you can download the Stereo app and follow me or Paula. That's at Paula Poundstone or at Adam Felber once you download the app. Or keep an eye on our Facebook page or our Twitter feeds, um, and you'll know when the next show is coming up. Uh, on the Facebook page or the Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone website, right? That's exactly right. Go to www.stereo.com slash at Paula Poundstone at Adam Felber. And then you can get started, and uh, you'll be taken right to our pages. R- remember, nobody listens to Paul Poundstone. We're having live audience interactive episodes on stereo pretty much once a week now. So join us.